misses and he misses to this song. No matter what, God is good because he's good, amen. Lately I've been looking back along this winding road to an old familiar markers of the mercies I have known. Oh, it may sound simple, but it's more than a cliche. There's no other way to tell you than to say God's been good. In my life, I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night. Though I've had my share of hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could. For through it all, God's been Times replay and I can see I've cried some bitter tears But I felt his arms around me As I faced my greatest fears I've Had more gains than losses No more joy than hurt As his grace rolled down upon me Undeserved God's been good in my life I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night though I've had my share of hard times I wouldn't change them if I could through it all God's been good God has been my father my Savior and my friend. His love was my beginning. His love will be my end. I could spend forever trying to tell you everything there is. But the best way I can say it is this. God's been good in my life. I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night. Though I've had my share of hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could. For through it all, God's been good. All right, if you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 14, and I really wouldn't understand why you didn't have your Bible if you come to this church, amen? amen. If we try to preach the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, working our way through uh, the book of Mark, it's been a blessing. I tell you what, I've got more out of this series, and I've been preaching 46 years this past Monday, I think it was this past Monday, it might have been the Monday before that, I forget, but anyway, uh, had to find it in the Bible to remember the first sermon I preached was on stepping out by faith, stepping out by faith, and that was a big step of faith for me because I was so shy, I didn't speak to my sister, but um, thank God for His grace and mercy. Amen. You know, God is good, and let me just say this, God is merciful, yes. and one of the parts of His goodness is that sometimes He realized we're not so good, that's what I'm going to preach on this morning, but He's still good to us. And He forgives us, and He restores us, and He gives us a second chance, and a third chance, and a fourteenth chance, and an eighty thousandth chance if we'll just get right with God and stay right with God. So I want to preach a message this morning on never say never. Never say never. Let me give you a report on Miss Helen. She came through the surgery with flying colors, the blockage in her neck. The vein going to her brain was uh, more blocked than they thought, but they had a, they did a, a great job on the surgery. I went by to see her Saturday morning, and she was in ICU checking out. So that's a blessing. You go from straight from ICU to home. Amen? And so that's a blessing. She wanted me to tell you, all of y'all that she was so thankful for your prayers. Amen? It's right over here on the senior citizen row. Amen? And uh, 
she's, she's quite a character and she loves God and she's, she's very, very in love with her church. And so thank you for praying for her. She's home now, doing real good. And I want to thank the glory class and the ladies class for the excellent meal. Um, it was great. I know Brother uh, Donald labored over the grill in 100 degree weather for many, many hours. And um, don't take that for granted. And all of you that served, and uh, it was just great. I mean, we had plenty and had a great fellowship, served right at 100, and then had a great service. Wasn't that a great service? I want to tell you something. Uh, that was one of the best messages I've heard an awesome preacher in August in a long time. On launch out in the deep. Launch out in the deep. Amen. Several of our men wanted to go deep sea diving after that. Amen. But that, that's not exactly what he's preaching on. I think they did Friday. Uh, but uh, it was go out and step out by faith anyway. Amen. And in Mark chapter 14, we're going to start with verse 26. And uh, I, want to, I want to preach a very uh, short message this morning. And then continue it tonight, because tonight I'm going to be preaching on the place of prayer to keep you from uh, getting to a place where you should never say never. And the place of prayer is with Jesus, and I hope you'll come at 5.30. If you can walk, you ought to come and pray for somebody that's going to have their leg amputated that's been in the ministry many, many years and loves this church. He tried to get up here the other Sunday, and it was raining so hard, he and his wife couldn't make it up here, but I want you to please be at prayer meeting at 5.30. We're going to pray for Brother Gary Ledford. We're going to pray for Brother Dan Reed, who's having this amputation Tuesday. And you ought to pray out of gratefulness. You ought to pray, God, you bless me. I want to, I want to pray you bless somebody else. Amen? Amen? So it's good to see each one of you here. We've got a visitor in the back. Mark, thank you for being with us. We've got Miss Stephanie's family with us all the way from Florida. Uh, it was a Florida fan that preached Tuesday. Amen? He, and I, he was almost disappointed last night. But uh, thank God for Brother Mike McDaniel. You pray for him. He wants to go out so wet, out west so bad because he loves out west. So you pray for him. He'll be starting revival there in a couple of weeks. Let's stand on the Word of God. Mark chapter 14, verse 26 through 31. So glad some people are here that we visited this week. They came back for the second time. That makes our day. Amen. Thank you for being here. Mark chapter 14, let's begin with verse 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. That's Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. But after that I am risen. Amen. He encouraged them after he told them how uh, they'd backslide. But after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said to him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. And Jesus said to him, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even in this night, before the cock crows twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. But he spake the more vehemently, If I should, if I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise, likewise also said they all. Now turn to verse 50, please. Verse 50, the same chapter. And the Bible says, And they all forsook him and fled. You may be seated as I pray. Father, thank you for this warning, not to have confidence in the flesh, not to ever think that we've arrived spiritually. But God, that we need your word. We need Sunday school. We need church. We need Sunday night. We need, we need Tuesday nights, Wednesday nights. We need every night with you in the word, every morning in home devotion, God, every day in prayer, because we're vulnerable, we're weak, we're fleshly, and there is a devil, there is a world, and there is a weak flesh. God, teach us never to say never, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name, amen. How many ever heard the uh, saying, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Now I want to tell you what that's talking about. Hypocrisy in the forest. Hypocrisy in the forest. Some of the biggest trees in the forest are hollow. Some of the biggest and most beautiful trees have raccoons living in them. There's nothing inside. Some of the biggest and most prestige trees in the forest are rotten 
inside. And friend, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. I want to take a passport from 2016 and put it here to remind me as I look at the first two missionaries on that passport. You never should say never. And you should always keep up your guard. In the spiritual life, there's no time that you have arrived. Folks, we all can be tempted. We all are weak. We all can fall. And folks, we sometimes are quick to judge others and measure our lives by their lives and say, well, I'm more spiritual than they are, and I would never do that. Don't you ever say that. Because you don't know what you'll do left to the flesh. Right. Left after you're bitter and after you're discouraged. Left after you feel like that you've been let down by people and let down by God even. You don't know what you'll do. The truth is, we spend our days sometimes deceiving ourselves and trying to deceive others how spiritual we really are. So I want to preach this a few minutes on never say never. And these verses today gives us a small taste of the conversation that Jesus was having as he walked from Jerusalem to the, through the Kindred Valley. That's where the blow, blood would flow down the river from all the sacrifices from Jerusalem in a few uh, days at the Passover. And on the way to a pl very familiar place, the Garden of Gethsemane, it's during this conversation that Jesus reveals to his men that they would all forsake him before the night was even over. And it was during this conversation that his men made this adamant declaration, not me, not me. You know, some, some of these men even said, do you think um, that I could ever fall? You, do you, you, you realize that I will never leave you? Even death would not keep me from uh, following you. And folks, these verses remind us of self-righteousness, of hypocrisy, a spiritual failure that's possible to every one of us, including the man that has three fingers pointing back at his heart. Never say never. First of all, I want you to see some prophecy in verse 27. The Bible says, And Jesus said unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. You turn to Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. You don't have to do that right now, but we got plenty of time. The Bible said exactly that. And when the shepherd... When the shepherd is smit, smitten, that the sheep would be scattered. And when they arrive, Jesus will pray a great prayer called the Lord's Prayer, John 17. Not Luke 11, not Matthew 6. That's the disciples' prayer. He's arrested. He's carried to a trial by his enemies. And on the way to Gethsemane, Jesus has some things he wants to say to these men as a prophecy. As a, as a forecast, and it's going to be an immediate fulfillment. That night, it's going to happen. That next morning, it's going to happen. Number one, the prophecy is this, you'll all fall. Jesus said, all ye shall be offended. Now, when the Lord says it, you better believe it. Say amen. amen. And the Bible says, all ye have, will, uh, will be offended because of me this night. The word offended means to make stumble, to fall away. You know, one of the worst things you could ever do is be a stumbling block. And I want to tell you something, friend. Many a great preachers that preach behind this pulpit, even an awesome preaching in August, because there were awesome preachers with an awesome word, have fallen. Many missionaries, I hold two in my hand right here, uh, that have fallen terribly. And they're out of the ministry today. And they were some of the most impressive couples with the sweetest kids that I've ever met in my life. And now they're on the sidelines because they might have said, Never, never. I would never be offended. Like all Jews, they were offended by the thought of anyone dying on a cross, much less anyone they knew that were associated with this. And so they didn't understand what was about to happen. And folks, they fell terribly. The Bible says in verse 50, they all forsook. Don't blame just Peter. All of them, 
All of them, the Bible says, forsook him. And so I see number two, the prophecy of a fulfillment. Jesus tells them that their failure would be fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy. As I said, Zechariah 13, verse 7, that Jesus would be betrayed by Judas Iscariot, and that was a part of the plan that was going to be fulfilled. And Jesus was their shepherd. He knew it. Now, I want to tell you something, folks. God, the Lord, is omniscient. He knows right now if you're thinking on this line or you got your mind on the golf tournament this afternoon. Or he knows if your mind is on the financial problems you're having. He, he knows what you're thinking right now. A lot of you just changed channels. Thank you. Uh, they, he, they, he, he knows what crazy thoughts is in your mind. You, uh, some, some thoughts that's not as important as this thought. God knows. You know what the fear of God is? That God knows. Hey, God knows. God knows your heart, and you better thank God He knows your heart. Surely this, this was uh, um, reassuring to the disciples. They knew, but I want to tell you something, folks. He knew their, what they were capable of, uh, of. He knew how weak they were. Don't ever say never. The truth is, but just by the grace of God, you're here today. I'll amen myself right there. Amen. It's only the grace of God that you're here. Amen. It's only the grace of God you'll stay awake for 30 minutes while I preach. Watch a ball game three hours. Let me preach against that a little bit. Amen. Just because I didn't go last night makes me spiritual, don't it? No. Glad y'all had a good time. I'm glad the Braves won. I was pulling for them. Who wants to go all the way to Rome and then lose? Amen. Praise God. We can do what we want to do, and we can, we can hang in there in overtime and triple time and everything else, but when it comes to preaching, for some reason, I, I, I must relax y'all. <laughs> Sometimes I get too relaxed preaching, but I want to tell you something. God knows what's, what your problem is. It's the flesh. Yes. It's weak. He knows the potential of you sinning. Don't ever say you won't. That's why we need to keep our guard up, amen? And so I see a prophecy. I see uh, the prophecy of fulfillment. I see the prophecy of a fall, but thank God, I want you to see, second of all, I see some promises. Aren't you glad of that? Amen. Aren't you glad you got a promise? Look at verse 28. It says, but after that, I, I am risen. I will go before you into Galilee. <laughs> amen. Folks, on the heels of the shocking prophecy, the Lord gives these men some comforting promise. And here's the comfort. After I'm risen, we see the promise of the resurrection. Amen. I want to tell you something. Without the resurrection, you're most miserable, and you will be most miserable. And without the resurrection, you can't be saved. Say amen. Jesus arose from the dead. And if he can overcome death, he can overcome hell, he can overcome the grave, but he can overcome you and your, your flesh. And you can be an overcomer even in the valley. And so he just told his men that he was going to die for their sins. Verse 22 through 25. What a Lord's Supper we had last night, or last Sunday night. Oh, it's precious. Sweet. Sweet. Uh, wonderful testimonies. I went home just so thrilled. And if you didn't go home thrilled, it's your own fault. Amen. Number one, you wasn't here. And number two is you didn't get what was going on. What was going on was worship. Amen. What was going on was gratefulness. Amen. What was going on was remembering the blood and remembering the body that was offered for you. Thank God for Calvary. Thank God he gave his life a ransom for many. And folks, after that, he arose. Amen. The cross was not our Lord's final stop. And he that knew no sin became sin for you. Turn to 1 Peter 3.18. This verse blessed my heart studying yesterday. 1 Peter 3.18. The Bible says, For Christ also has once suffered for, our, for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but listen to this, but quickened by the Spirit. Folks, I want to tell you how you have victory, by the Spirit. I want to tell you how you have victory, by the Word and the Spirit. I want to tell you how you have victory over your own self, the Spirit of God in you, through you, living through you. In your flesh, you cannot do a thing that pleases God. 
Oh, folks, the resurrection is of supreme importance. Read 1 Corinthians 15 sometimes. It's the promise that gives hope for tomorrow and for all eternity. Then I see the promise of restoration, not only the resurrection. He says, I'll go before, uh, I will go before you in Galilee. I get that. Jesus just told them they were going to all forsake him. He said, but don't worry, boys. I'm going to die on the cross for you. I'm going to redeem you by my precious blood. I'm going to rise three days later, then I'm going to meet you. Thank God. And he wasn't going to meet them to uh, upbraid them and scold them. He was going to meet them to forgive them and to commission them and empower them. Aren't you glad that God can still use people that fall? And don't you put your spiritual uh, nose in the air, but you might drown when it rains. Thank God for the rain last night. Hallelujah. But I want to say this, friend. You are only here by the grace of God and if somebody falls, you ought to restore them with meekness, knowing how, you're, how, how weak you really are. It could have been you. It could have been you. However, his words here are a promise of restoration on the other side of failure. There's restoration on the other side of failure. Let me just say this, folks. In Christianity, failure is not final. Thank God for that. I'm glad God picked me up when I backslid. Amen. I'm glad God restored me. I'm glad God can use me even though when I was a teenager I fell away from God. And I lived for myself. And I lived for my sport. And I lived for my scholarship. And I lived for just uh, me, myself, and I. And got out of the will of God. And God came looking for me. And God broke me. And God helped me. God restored me. And I've been pastoring this church 41 years. Amen. And folks, if he hadn't forgiven me in my teenage years for wasting it, I wouldn't be usable today. Right. I'd be disqualified. Knocked down and knocked out. But praise God, I was knocked down, but I got back up by the grace of God. Amen. I can't speak for you, but I can tell you how I feel. I don't want to fail the Savior. I don't want to fail him. I don't want to be a castaway. He died for me. He died for you. He saved me. He saved you. Could I have an is that, That's where you ought to say amen right there. Whether you amen my sermon or nothing or ever. Just say amen right there. You're saved. Amen. And you ought to amen him because he saved you. I didn't. When he called me by faith, he called you by faith. He's blessed you. He's used you. He's done more through you than you could ever understand or ever deserved. His grace has been sufficient for you in every valley. Thank you, choir. Thank you, choir. His love has never wavered. His word has always proven itself to be true. He has given you and me everything, and I owe him absolute love and absolute loyalty and absolute devotion I do not want to fail him. I do not want to fail him. And you ought to not want to fail him. It ought to be the worst fear of your life to blaspheme the name of God through failure, through being a castaway, by going into sin. It's not all the ugly sin we hear. It's just the sin of indifference, the sin of lack of faith. He convicts me of my sin. He chastens me. He loves me. He draws me back. When I repent, the Bible says he's just and faithful to forgive me of all Amen. unrighteousness. God. Thank God. Thank God. So I see some prophecies. I see some promises. But then here's the shocking part. I see some pronunciations. I see some pronouncements. He's just going to make some statements. And folks, these statements... These disciples aren't going to like. You know, every time I preach, I don't expect you to like it. Lump it and bump it, as Brother Nathan Gregory says often. But I think you ought to appreciate it. I think you ought to appreciate a preacher to step on your toes. Amen. I believe you ought to preach, appreciate a preacher to pr preach the truth. We're not here trying to join a club. We're not here trying to uh, uh, ease our conscience. But our teacher this morning, Brother Jack, he... I never saw, uh, I thought he was going to speak in tongues. He was, he was uh, teaching so fast, amen. He went through all those points so quick, but it was the best lesson I've ever heard, amen. Praise God. 
25 minutes. Keep it up. No, that's what they say to me all the time, too. It don't work. But I want to tell you something. He was talking about Joel Osteen down in Atlanta charging $38 a seat. And then if you want the good seats, you get them for $158. So you can have the power of positive belief and faith and everything will work out good for you. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Studying the book of Job, it didn't all work out good for Job. But praise God, praise God, in the end, he was blessed and a blessing. Amen. Something good's going to happen to you today. Folks, it's something bad might happen to you today. And I'll tell you what, the worst thing that happened to you today is you left on your own and you deny Christ in your everyday life. You go back into sin. You go back and do what you always condemned everybody else, independent Baptists, that uh, they did when you was right with God and when you was ushering and when you was deacon and, and when you was preaching. What you, all, what you condemned and what you looked down on, now you're doing it. Now it's quiet. I don't always preach for hallelujah, amen. Sometimes I preach for an old me. That's right. Folks, you remember when you was close to God. You remember when you lived for God. You remember when the word was precious. You remember when prayer was real. You remember when the Holy Spirit's presence was real and relevant in your life. And that's the main thing in your life. But folks, I want to tell you something. He pronounces some things. Number one, he pronounces a denial. Look at verse 29. But Peter said to him, Although all shall be offended, yet will I not. Peter said, Hey, these other fellows might fall, but I'll never will. You can't trust them, but you can trust me, Lord. I will never fail you. Lord, you can depend on me. Others might leave you, but I'll always be here. That's what he was saying. He just pronounced it. And folks, Peter probably believed every word he was saying. He probably believed every word he was saying. He did not leave his old life to fail. He didn't leave his uh, fisherman career just to be a failure, uh, be one that's uh, talked about and preached about for years and years and millennials and millennials about being a failure. But folks, failure was not final for Peter. Have you read the book of Acts chapter 2 sometime? Amen. Have you read the book of Acts? I believe he came back. And I believe God restored him. And God used him in a precious way. In a special way. Then I see not only a denial, I see a declaration. Look at verse 30. And Jesus said to him, Verily I say unto thee, that This day even in this night, Before the cock crows twice, Thou shalt deny me thrice. Now the Lord just called the most unusual preacher in the Bible, say amen, a rooster. Most unusual. Uh, Brother Rooster let her rip that night. He didn't preach long. He just preached a few minutes. But folks, he preached what God told him to preach. Praise God, he preached it with the authority of the Creator in him. And thank the Lord it got to Peter. <laughs> most unusual message in the Bible. I would try to say it, but it'd come out cock a cock a doodle if I tried it. Amen. <laughs> the Lord said, Before the sun goes down, Peter, you'll deny me three times. Or shoot, excuse me, before the sun goes up, that's when a rooster crows, isn't it? Amen. Right. I remember I was down at Ari Keeper, Peru, and the sun come up at four o'clock in the morning, and that crazy rooster thought it was time to get up, and he'd start just to letting it rip. So I know I'm in a third world country. I said, if I could find that rooster, I'd shoot him and have him for lunch and prove I'm a Baptist. But anyway, the Lord tells him, before the sun comes up next morning, you're going to deny me not once, not twice, but three times. You'll see in a few weeks when I preach this passage, verse 66 through 72, it happened. And it was terrible. And he wept. There was a lot of people through the ages Wanted to use it for excuse. Then I see number, number three, the debate. Look at verse 31. But he spoke the more vehemently. He wide-eyed, lifted his voice. Don't ever do that to God. You'll lose every time. Don't you debate God. Just submit to God. Look at this. But he spake the more vehemently. If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all. So they all chimed in. Don't just blame Peter. 
Peter's response was typical of Simon Peter. He refused to listen and he had a big mouth. My wife has been with me 50 years. And she could have said that about me a lot many times. You refuse to listen and you got a big mouth. She never has said that. Well, maybe she has. But she's still with me. Amen. <laughs> Patient woman. Hallelujah. We celebrated it Friday by going to the curb market and some Mary Doe uh, tea house, and we had a we had a blast. Taking pictures of hog feet and hog noses and uh, all kinds of hog jowls and all kinds of stuff. And I said, what are we doing here on this special day? And it's where we met. It's where we set up. Now, I'm getting off track here, but I want to tell you something. I never want to let my wife down. Amen. Much less leave, let the Lord down. Right. And folks, he started arguing like a lot of couples do. That's where we're getting to. And he vehemently, he raised his voice, his eyes were bulging, his jaw was set. He said, I will not, I will not. All these guys will, but not me. Don't you ever say that. And after this night, they would all back away from the commitment to Jesus to a certain degree, and some would briefly abandon him. They would return to their old life and go fishing. John 21, verse 3. And so all these men abandoned him, verse 50. Now, I'm closing, so listen up. I'm going to give you just four quick points, but we're early. Brother Randy was flying. Praise God. Amen. I'm glad he didn't look at the clock. Gave me more time. Amen. And I appreciate him. There are only two. Peter and John went all the way to the trial, and one of them cussed. If you want to really identify the world, just talk like it. Amen. I want to tell you something. A man that cusses a lot, has a poor vo vocabulary and a wicked heart. Amen. Amen. And use the dictionary if you want to tell somebody off. Don't cuss them out. <laughs> Amen. No, don't do that either. And over three, why? This is my question. I want to close with this. Why I think they fell. Why did over three years of intimate communion with Jesus Christ on this earth, did they abandon him? Why did they run away in the fear of that night, I want to suggest four things in closing. Number one, pride. Pride. They never thought they could fail. That's pride. They believed that they were above all that. Somebody else can backslide, but not me. Proverbs 16, 18. The Bible says, pride go before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Don't ever say never. And don't ever say you don't need Sunday school. That's pride. That's right. Don't ever say you, need, you don't need Sunday night. You're going to come one time a week. And that's, that's pride. Don't ever say you don't need Wednesday night Bible study verse by verse through the book of 1 John. That's pride. Folks, I'm going to tell you something, friend. You need more of the Word of God today in these last days than you've ever needed in your life. Can somebody say amen? It's not getting any easier. As a matter of fact, it's not getting any brighter. It's darker than it's ever been. And there's more people blaspheming God. And there's more people making fun of God. And there's more people living like heathens out there than ever before. And somebody needs to step up yes. and say, Lord, I can't live without you. Amen. I can't do it without you. Proverbs chapter 24, or excuse me, 28. Proverbs 28. Look at it. Book of Wisdom. At least write it down, okay? Verse 14, 28 verse 14, the Bible says this, Happy is a man that feareth always, but he that hardened his heart shall fall into mischief. Happy is a man that feareth always. And that don't mean fear man and fear the devil. It means fear God. Right. Know that God knows. And know that God knows and God cares. And know that God knows and God cares, but God loves you. He saved you. He helps you every day. He blesses you every day. If it wasn't for the grace of God, you couldn't have got out of bed this morning. That's right. Much less held a job down this week. The fact is, the best among us is only one heartbeat away from denying the Lord. Only one step away from the far country. Only one step away from the prodigal pig pen. We used to have a preacher every year, and I booked him every year because he was such an amazing orator. And excuse me, he had me deceived. And maybe he was right with God when he preached here. And I'm going to tell you something, he was eloquent. 
He was written up in every sort of lore there was. He was in every big conference in the, in the world. I mean, he, he was building the fastest growing Sunday school in Decatur, Georgia. In all of Georgia, the fastest growing church. Uh, he took it from bro, bro, Brother Curtis Hudson. And then he one day got up and said, I don't need God. He didn't tell me this personally, but I guarantee you, you backslide privately a lot quicker than before you backslide publicly. Say amen. You, hey, listen, you get up one morning, you don't read your Bible. Nobody knows it, but God knows it. And your heart gets hard, and your heart gets callous, your heart gets cold. And then when sin's temptation comes, you're vulnerable. Amen. He went to the sort of Lord conference and started watching pornography in the room. Then he started calling in prostitutes in his room and then going preaching at the Sword of Lord conference. He got, he got caught. I preached in his church the next Sunday night after he got caught. His mother sitting on the second row weeping and half the church was crying so loud I couldn't even preach to him. Recommended Brother Lou Rossi go on the scene. He went on there and praise God he preached for seven years and he found out the whole church was full of it. Fastest growing church in Georgia. Greatest named church in Georgia. And folks, he was the greatest orator I've ever heard in my life. But I'm going to tell you something, he fell. And I guarantee you where he fell was, I don't need to read my Bible. I don't need Sunday school. I don't need Master Club. I don't need to serve. I don't need to be faithful. I don't need to pray. I got it down. I got my five sermons I preach all over the world. And I, I can just go ahead and preach automatic, and he could, but I want to tell you something, God didn't preach to him. Flesh profiteth nothing. And pride will deceive you into thinking, oh, Lord, all these jaybirds will backslid, but not me, Lord. Number two, I believe that pride is one of the reasons that these men fail. But number two, self-deception. These Disciples convinced themselves that they loved Jesus more than anything in life. That's why when Peter was restored, he says, do you love me more than these? He's looking at the nets and the boats probably. Maybe all those fish that he caught. Maybe these other disciples. He said, Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs. And he asked him three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And folks, I want to tell you something. He was deceived thinking he loved People more, love God more than any of all these other disciples, anyone. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 3. Turn with me there, please. I want you to find that verse now. Galatians chapter 6, verse 3. I'm going to mark this because I'm coming back to this chapter. But verse 3 says for this, If, if a man thinketh, to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Right. Let me just say this real clear, and I know I'm, 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 I'm meddling, but I need to. You're, you're no match for the devil. Right. You're no match for the devil. And I'll just be honest with you, you're no match for this world. Right. It'll lure you, it'll advertise to you, it'll deceive you into thinking you're macho, camacho, and tough man, listen to me young people that you can be the leading guy on the campus, that you can be the greatest athlete, but I'm going to tell you something friend you leave God out and he'll and, and the devil will ruin your life the world promises many things he never that it never pays says you'll be popular and you'll one day be lonely you'll be rich and one day you'll be broke, you'll be smart and wise and one day you'll feel like you're insane You'll be strong and macho and popular and, and all the girls will love you. One day you'll be broken without hope and without a home and without even your own children in your own home. The devil always shows you the front yard of sin but never shows you the backyard of sin. The devil always shows you the first chapter of sin but never shows you the last chapter of sin. We need to be wise to see the end of sin and the end of self Folks, these disciples said, no, 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 no. I'm not capable of that. Never let yourself believe that you're not. Turn to Romans chapter 7 just real quick. Romans chapter 7. I preached a message. I ought to preach it again. I hadn't preached it in 20 years. And 
Y'all wouldn't remember I preached the first time after 20 years, would you? I could preach and y'all thought, boy, that's new, amen? Well, I do that often, y'all just don't know it. But look at this, Romans chapter 7. I preached a message on get out of Romans 7 and get in Romans 8. I'm going to tell you why you ought to get out of Romans 7 because Romans 7 is full of I and Romans 8 is full of the Spirit. You need to get out of your eye and get in the Spirit. You need to get out of the flesh and get in the Spirit, say amen. You need to realize that without God, you're going to be confessing with Paul that you're wretched, that you're weak, and that you're Wilson. I'll just read just a few verses of Paul's testimony now. I'm talking about the Apostle Paul. Look at verse 14. It says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Look at verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For that I would that I do I not, but what I hate, that I do. And then I do that which I would not. I consent unto the law that is, that is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Look at verse 18. For I know that in me, that in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. That's a great confession. For to will is present with me, but how to perform it, that which is good I find not. Look at verse 19. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. That's right. You ever been there, done that? Don't raise your hand. Amen. Just come to the altar. It says, Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Yes. And I find in law that which I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of the God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into what? Captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Now here's a confession. Oh, wretched man that I am. Come on now. Apostle Paul can say it. You can say it. Come on. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? But I like verse 25. I like positive coming out of negative. Because the hope is Jesus. He says, but I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Then I could read all 39 verses of of Romans chapter 8 and it's just one great testimony of the Spirit of God and the love of God that's in you. See, it's not a matter of wheeling and dealing. It's a matter of yielding. If I could repeat that, it's not a matter of wheeling and dealing. It's a matter of yielding. Who are you yielding to? Who are you really yielding to? And so, folks, I believe, first of all, the sin of pride came in these disciples' lives. Not me! And then I believe the sin of self-deception came into life. Well, not, I can, I'm not going to sin. I'm a disciple. I'm a man of God. I'm strong spiritually. I was raised in Whitfield Baptist Church. I'm a deacon at Whitfield Baptist Church. I'm the preacher of Whitfield Baptist Church. Self-deception. You're a sinner saved by grace and you better stay close to God. Number three. Fear. You got it? Somebody taking notes. Thank you, Brother Daryl. Amen. Somebody else taking notes? Throw your pencil at me. Okay, good. Miss Stephanie, thank you. Good. We're taking we're taking class notes here. Miss Carolyn Stiles takes notes and she goes to college all her life. She likes it so much. Amen. Praise God. That's good. Notes. But you better write this down. Fear. These men were confident they would go with Jesus even to death. But they're they're about to be brought face to face with fear. Fear has caused many of children of God to back away, to lose their testimony. Fear has caused many to be silent. Fear has caused many to succumb to the crowd's pressure. How about it, young people? Peer pressure will drain you and bring you down because you're fearing 
that you won't be accepted. And you're fearing that nobody will like you on your little Facebook. And you're fearing you won't be popular. And you're fearing you won't be beautiful. And you're fearing you won't get a husband. And you fear this and you fear that. But I want to tell you something, folks. The only fear that will keep you straight is the fear of God. Amen. Fear has magnified the power of Satan when you're fearful. The worldly fear has minimized the power of Almighty God. Never underestimate the power of fear. Fear. Fear is a great motivator. Say amen. I remember I used to have a paper out. I'd be tired. My wife got, my wife, my mama got me a, and she's nothing like my mama as far as telling me what to do all the time, but my mama gave, told me I'd go to work at 12 years of age. And she bought me a bicycle, and then she put this big old basket on the front of it. I mean, it was, huge. it was bigger than me. It was huge. I said, Mama, what's this for? She says, you're going to get a paper out, Amen. and you're going to deliver papers in Tony Valley. I said, okay. She said, I said, why? She says, because you need to learn to work, boy. I said, well, that's the kind of mother I had. Praise God. Maybe that's why I'm still pastoring after 42 years. I learned to work Amen. and like it. And I remember I'd be so tired. Tired of collecting 52 cents a week from every customer for the crazy Atlanta Journal. That's awful. You know, why in the world didn't they bill it and send it in like they do today? But we had to collect it. But I'll tell you what really motivated me one day was two big old German shepherds got after me. And I'm going to tell you something, friend. I was dead tired. But when I saw them coming and they had a reputation of, of biting people's calves. I'm not talking about cows. I'm talking about the back of your leg. And I remember I was dead tired, highest, highest hill on Miriam Lane. That was my paper route, about two blocks from my house. I remember I chugged up that. I, had, I started throwing papers out of the, on the sidewalk, just <laughs> missing mailboxes, missing driveways. I was motivated out of fear. You ever been motivated out of fear? Come on. Some of y'all think about some of the things about you was motivated by fear. But folks, I'll tell you something. We ought to be motivated by the fear of God. Amen. What a fear fell in him. What a fear disgracing him. What a fear letting him be disappointed in us. Come on, say amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 tells us that the conclusion of the whole matter is to fear God and keep his commandments. Say amen. amen. That's the conclusion of the whole matter. That's the bottom line, praise God. That we ought to fear God and keep His commandments. And folks, look, look what the next verse says. The last verse in Ecclesiastes says, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. I fear the judgment seat of Christ. And I don't want to face Him one day and say, Well, I thought I'd never fail you. I thought I'd always be faithful. I thought I wouldn't be dropping into sin. I thought I'd be a great man of God. I thought I'd finish right. I want to finish right. Amen. And folks, I want you to know that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And folks, what we ought to do is fear God and that He knows all about our life. Right. He knows how we treat our wife. He knows how we treat our children. He knows how we treat each other. He knows our private time. He knows what we think in our private time. He knows our computer life. He knows our TV life. He knows our listening life. He knows our entertainment life. He knows how much time you think about Him during the week. He knows how much you love Him. And so, folks, I believe that they just let pride, self-deception, and fear, and then let me say last but not least, ignorance cause them to fall the disciples were ignorant of the power of Satan the disciples were ignorant of the power and weakness of the flesh Satan is behind this failure, turn to Luke chapter 22 in closing, Luke chapter 22 and I'll read one more verse and we'll go and we're really early, that's great Luke chapter 22 I want you to look at it, verse 31 through 34. The Bible says in verse 31 of Luke chapter 22, you with me? Say amen. amen. It says this, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Behold! 
He said this to him before the denial. Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Look at verse 32. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, that means when you get right with God, not you get saved again, strengthen thy brethren. Aren't you glad you got a ministry after failure? Aren't you, got a, uh, aren't you got, glad you got a ministry after restoration? And he said, after you get right with God, use your testimony, strengthen the brethren. Folks, self-confidence is deadly in the spiritual life. I want you to turn to one more verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, and I'll quote a couple more verses. We'll go. But I'm not really interested in going. I'm, I'm really interested in Jesus coming, but we'll go. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. The Bible says this. Look at it now. I want you to circle it. I want you to highlight it if you've got a highlighter. I want you to put amen in the column if you've got an empty column like i got. i got a Schofield Bible. With no notes, so it's a Cofield Bible. I put my own notes in there. It's not that I meant smarter than Schofield, but anyway. Look at verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Yes. Folks, when you don't pray every day, you think, you, you, you think you've arrived. It's nothing but stinking pride. When you don't read your Bible every day, you think you can handle it in your words. You think you can out-talk the devil. You think you can out-think him. You think you can handle him in your own wisdom. You think you don't need church as much as you used to need church. Folks, you need church more than you need church, ever need church. And as, as the day's approaching, so much the more. We ought to exhort and provoke each other to love. Amen? So now I can do that on the Internet. You can't provoke nobody on the Internet. No offense, Internet crew. You cannot be an encouragement if they don't know you're listening. But if you're in here saying amen, glory to God, amen, nodding, coming back up, looking like a halfway entrance, maybe there's a young person saying, hey, I want his faith. I want his appetite. I want his interest. I want his diligence. But what you ought to say is, you ought to want my discipline because I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm going to fail. I'm afraid I'm going to quit. I'm afraid I'm going to blaspheme the name of God. I'm afraid I'm going to shame God. I'm just afraid. And I can't live without you, Jesus. I can't live without your word. I can't live without your spirit. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 13 says, We ought to stand in him and put on the whole armor of God. The whole armor of God. That we might withstand in the evil days. Guess what? We're in them. If it gets any more evil, we're going to be in hell. Say amen. Amen. If it gets any more evil, we're going to have the rapture take place. Amen. And I want to tell you something, friend. In these last days, there's a warfare going on, and you, so, you soldiers know what it takes to be a good soldier. Discipline. Show it up for drills. Taking that rifle apart and putting it back together. And the Bible says you win this war on your knees because Ephesians chapter 6 says that folks who are praying always with all supplication. In all the Spirit, praise God for one another, for all saints. We win it on our knees. And we win it by exhorting and helping either, each other. I close. On my desk while I was preparing this message, so little time, Colossians 4, 5, Missions Revival, 2016. I opened the page and the first page was the blues. Thank God for him. Amen. Thank God Brother Stennett finished right. Yes. Thank God Brother Stennett finished in the will of God Amen. preaching. They had to drive him to his last meeting. He was so weak. But he went and he preached. But then you go to the next page. And there's this little couple and I'm not going to give their names. And there's two little blonde headed little babies. Now she's expecting again. He was called to preach at Brother Chris Hanks' church in Colorado. Called to Mission Field. And I got a letter a few months ago saying, I've committed adultery. I've cheated on my wife and my children. 
I'm disqualified from the ministry. I'm coming home. Breaks my heart. Now, since then, he has restored everything he can. His wife has forgiven him. Thank God for a godly wife. And he's coming home with a family. He's coming home with his girls. He's coming home with his new baby. He was just born. I don't know if it was a girl or boy, Miss Connie. But I thought about this couple. So personable, so sharp, so sweet. I just fell in love with them over in Colorado. I said, come on, come on and uh, come on and uh, be a part, part of us. We got several missionaries in your several of the mission of the, on the, your mission field. But you just come on and present. Boy, he won all y'all's heart. That family stayed with one of our families, and I mean, they really fell in love with him. What happened? Never. Say never. Never. Say never. Pray. Yield to the Spirit. Stay in church. Stay in the Word. Stay in fellowship with each other, praise God. Don't get bitter. That'll, that'll, that'll sideline you in a second. The root of bitterness causes a lot of sins. There are people in this room who never thought that they would be living the life they're living now. I mean many of you. When you were saved, you promised the Lord you'd live for Him and that you would be faithful to Him, His house and His word without hesitation. Now you're a little more than a passing acquaintance with the things of God. You don't pray. You don't read your Bible. You don't live for Jesus like you used to live for Jesus. You don't come to Sunday school. You don't come on Wednesday night. You don't come back on Sunday night because something else is more important. You never thought it happened. But it has happened. You're doing things that you, you allow in your life probably that you thought was so off limit that you wouldn't even go near it. What happened? Well, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 2, Verse 5, you left your first love. You didn't lose it. You don't lose God's love. You leave it. Right. The other, other year, we were driving down the road, and my wife looked at me and said, we don't sit as close as we used to. I was just driving along. I said the stupidest thing. I looked at her and said, well, I hadn't moved. That was not the right thing to say. But you know something? God hadn't moved. We've moved. And I fight it every day. I'm not trying to preach down on you, and I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help you. But I want to tell you something. The biggest battle of my life is to stay close to God. Amen. Biggest battle of my life is to keep my heart pure. Listen now. If a preacher has to fight it, so do you. Amen. If Peter failed, you can. If Paul said, hey, I'm nothing but a wretched, weak person, I think we ought to confess that. Might be tomorrow, you that are so self righteous, that you'll be sitting in the same place. I told you I'd go back to Galatians chapter 2. The Bible says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such as one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear, with, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Amen. Folks, listen. We ought to restore people with meekness. Meekness means not weakness. Meekness means you just can't do it by yourself. Meekness means strength controlled. Meekness is not just thinking down on yourself. It's just not thinking of yourself. But it's thinking right of yourself that, hey, I can't make it without you, Jesus. And so there's four reasons. I hope you wrote them down. Pride, self-deception, fear. In ignorance, never say never. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this message. I'm going to preach it to a bunch of preachers in a couple of weeks at the Tri-State Preachers Fellowship because we need it.
because I need it. We all need it because we're all weak. We're all sinners saved by the grace of God. Amen. And Lord, we're just one step away from joining the disciples and forsaking them. God, help us to be faithful. Help us to be disciplined. Help us to stay in love with you and have your love be preeminent over all our loves of the world. And we're going to praise you.